Smiles should be contagious. Experiences, shared. Connections, meaningful. This is how progress starts. We all need doors opened, shoulders to stand on, and high fives along the way. We're never too old to play. Minds and hearts should be full. Successes celebrated. Passions sparked. Dreams achieved. There is no such thing as other people's children. Young people aren't just the future. We are the present. We are all on this journey together. It's not just what you know, it's who you know. Who stood by you? And who will you stand by? Mentoring amplifies. Welcome to the Fostering Leadership Through Youth-Led Movements Plenary. Join us in welcoming from EY, Corporate Responsibility Leader, Erica Patterson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My dad is a Baptist preacher, so let me do it one more time. Good afternoon. <laughs> I am Erica Patterson, and I lead corporate responsibility for EY Americas. That is the United States, Israel, Canada, and Latin America. And I am excited, I'm beyond excited to be here at my first mentor conference in person. And I'm excited to be able to present today's Corporate Youth Leadership Award, which recognizes a young person who has participated in corporate mentoring initiative and shown great leadership potential. EY has been a long supporter of mentoring for decades, partnering with mentor and other organizations to drive lasting positive change in our communities. And we are proud to be the premier sponsor of this conference and we are excited, and I'm excited to tell you this is our 12th consecutive year of a sponsorship level. Yes. Because we believe that companies play an important role in advancing the mentoring movement, and EY is so proud to lead the change by modeling and sharing learnings from our signature corporate youth mentoring program called College Map. These programs are critical to supporting young leaders like our next award winner to discover their passions, explore career paths, and build social capital. I'm delighted to present this year's Corporate Youth Leadership Award to high school student Pritaka Karkwell. whose corporate mentoring journey began at Step Up, a nonprofit organization that helps girls define and achieve their unique visions of success through structured programs, focused support, and inspiring connections. At the young age of 15, Pritaka has already demonstrated a thirst for learning and natural ability to lead, inspire, and catalyze others. At Step Up, Pritaka was selected to participate in an experience ship program with Home Depot, which included a mini internship and mentorship opportunities. She was then chosen to present at the experience ship capstone celebration, where she shared learnings and highlights from her experience to an audience of corporate volunteers and peers. She was also selected to serve on a Truth Talk panel moderated by television and film star Julie Bowen at Step Up's annual Digital Summit fundraiser. 
Since joining Step Up, Pritaka has taken advantage of a myriad of opportunities to seek out mentorship, like attending nine virtual corporate field trips offered with companies like NBC Universal, Benefit Cosmetics, and Google. Committed to paying it forward, all she gained through her Step Up experience, Pritaka has also worked to directly identify opportunities to bring Step Up to her own school campus and recruit peers to join. It is no surprise that when nominating her for this award, Step Up staff noted, and I quote, ever since she joined her very first event with us, Pritaka has been one of our organization's most active, enthusiastic, and dedicated team members. And if all of that wasn't enough, beyond her Step Up experience, Pritaka has shown impressive leadership in her school and community. She is the founder of her school's Girls Who Code Club and the student representative for the Legislative Leadership Committee. She has received several accolades for her deep commitment to volunteerism, including the Ambassador Level National Community Service Award for UN Goals and the Gold Presidential Volunteer Services Award. Pritaka is also a mental health advocate with plans to write a book about mental health for teens. All the while, when I was 15, 16, I was trying to get to a football game, I'm just saying. And I met her. I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, right before coming on. And she also told me that she aspires to attend Columbia, Harvard, or Stanford. Give it up and help me congratulate Pritaka. Come on, Pritaka. I said her name wrong and she let me know. I apologize. And I've been practicing, so say it so I don't get it wrong. Um, Pratika Karkal. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing today? I'm very excited to be here. Um, my name is Pratika Karkwal, um, with the I. <laughs> um, I'm a resident of Plano, Texas, and I'm a 10th grader at Lebanon Trail High School, Frisco, Texas. First off, I would like to thank Mentor for recognizing me with such a prestigious award, and it would have not happened without active guidance and nomination from the Step Up Organization for Girls Empowerment. So thank you to Step Up. And I would also like to thank my school teachers and all the mentors in my life. I'm very fortunate to have this opportunity to encourage youth across the country to pursue their dreams. And my personal mentoring journey started off with a couple of reflections. My first reflection came up from my mentoring ecosystem at home, which was primarily influenced by my dad, who provides me with constant guidance and encouragement to do the right things. One fine Saturday, he shared his life story with me, and long story short, he discussed how he didn't know the concept or importance of a mentor, and so he didn't reach out to one for inputs and missed out on an important opportunity. So he became my mentor, and um, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned from him is that hard skills and soft skills are important, but for decision making, what's very important is your state of mind. So through indirect mentoring by my dad, I learned that a positive state of mind and awareness are the keys to success. My second reflection also began at home where my mom and dad always taught me to be empathetic towards others. And once I realized this trait ingrained within me, the impact was almost immediate in my life. One day a girl, she was one of my classmates, she looked very upset and anxious about something. And so after class I approached her and asked her what was going on. She told me that she was getting bullied by a boy in the class and she was running away from him and his friends in the fear of being teased by them. And so I put myself in her shoes and understood how much anxiety this could cause, especially as a high school student. And um, so I told her to stand up for herself, 
not be the football of others' opinions, and reach out to school administrators if necessary. A couple of weeks passed, and to my surprise, I was called to the front office to meet with my school's assistant principal, who told me that the girl had reached out to them and told them what was going on, and he appreciated me for the kind gesture. And I was surprised that day. Um, I didn't know that me saying one thing could make such a big difference in someone's life. And I realized that every positive step that we take, no matter how big or how small, really does have the potential to make the world of a difference in someone's life. Having a mentor or someone I can rely on at home positively affected my life for sure, but I wanted to make mentoring not just an important part of my story's life, or my life story, but I wanted to make it an integral part of other youth's lives. And so I used these two reflections to define my why, my purpose for my active engagement with the Step Up organization. And without a purpose, I don't think mentoring would have ever worked out for me or for anybody else. So I worked on helping young girls, mentoring, and broadening my network through corporate events, sessions, and workshops. And I believe that I've always been an outspoken person. However, mentoring has allowed me to listen first and then use my communication skills in synergizing creative engagements and guiding mentees in the right direction. Being a mentor has also allowed me to evolve my perspective on both youth empowerment and mental health advocacy as well. So youth are the future of society, but we're at a very fragile phase in our lives where every action we take today affects our tomorrow. Today, we have access to digital technology that helps us grow our information exponentially, but unfortunately not our wisdom. Only a mentor can do that. Therefore, I appeal to all the attendees here today to support youth mentoring efforts because your support will not only help young individuals, but in turn, all of society. Once again, I would like to thank Mentor for this wonderful opportunity, and I want to thank you, all the attendees here today, for giving me your time and letting me be a voice for the youth. Lastly, thank you to my family, especially my dad, for engraving the ideals of positivity and compassion. It has truly shaped me to be who I am today. So let's all work together to build a future for the youth, a future with mentoring. Thank you. From Boys and Girls Clubs of America, the 2022 National Youth of the Year, ASHA. Hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here. As you've just heard, my name is Asha Hedox Rossiter, and I'm the 2022 National Youth of the Year for the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And I can still remember the first woman that I considered a mentor growing up. When I started with the Boys and Girls Clubs, I was a timid nine-year-old afraid of her own shadow. And every day when our club bus would come pick me up from school, I would sit in the very front away from all the other kids. And every day, Miss Danielle would come sit right next to me. She would ask me about my day, what my interests were, and if I knew the name of the Imagine Dragon song that the kids were singing in the back. And every day, I was fine. I didn't have any interests, and they were singing Radioactive. <laughs> and while I was content to stay as I was in my all-knowing nine-year-old mind, Miss Danielle saw something in me that I didn't quite see yet. And so every day, she would sit next to me and ask the same questions. Until one day, I was actually doing pretty great. And I kind of like to draw, and yes, they are still singing Radioactive in the back. <laughs> When I started with the Boys and Girls Clubs, I was able to be poured into by so many caring adults who saw something in me that I didn't see yet. From Miss Danielle, our art director, to Miss Olivia, the director of the greatest musical to ever grace a Boys and Girls Club stage, you're a good man, Charlie Brown, <laughs> to Miss Yoli, who would let me pull up a rolly chair to the front desk and discuss the absolute mess that was middle school relationships. Mentors are invaluable to helping youth find their voices. We are living in unprecedented times. 
Youth now more than ever are in desperate need of safe spaces where they can work out their thoughts and feelings and ideas with caring people who are willing to build them up, not to tear them down. Because the reality is that it was people just like you who watched me grow up. From barely four foot 11 inches tall and glasses held together with mustache tape given to me by Miss Yoli at the front desk, to coaching me on how to project without yelling, to giving me an enthusiastic thumbs up as I walk across a stage, ready to pour my hopes and dreams out to a room filled to the brim with people. I walk through the world pockets heavy with the nuggets of wisdom and aspirations that people like you dropped in my open hands over and over and over again. You handed me a paintbrush and told me the world is my canvas, supplied me with watercolor ideas, acrylic dreams, and charcoal opportunities. You put me on your shoulders and dared me to imagine the world as I want it, and in the same breath gave me the audacity to create it. So, when I say I want to be the President of the United States of America, you are not surprised because you are the one who told me that I could do it in the first place. So when I am found on the street corners of failure and ignorance, and when they inevitably try to slip envy and disbelief through the cracks in my door, you simply pick me up, dust me off, and send me out again. You mentors and volunteers are invaluable, supplying the children you meet with wild imaginations, filling their heads with ideas of a world that they can make a difference in. You have watched me find my voice. Whether we are, you meet us where we are, whether we are in the midst of a college education, or whether we are still young enough to believe that civilizations can exist on the smallest point of a pen, you have seen the pinpoint of a young mind waiting to be developed. And most importantly, you've taught me that it doesn't stop with me. So in every world that I imagine, those in which I've changed the sky to be various shades of cotton candy pink, are those where the wildest, most fantastical parts of my imagination are realized. There is one consistent thread weaving in and out of these fanciful realizations. And it's that I could not have gotten to where I am today if it had not been for caring adults who walked with me every step. So thank you for the worlds that you have not only made possible for me, but for the ones I know that you can continue to make possible for those who come after. Thank you. To moderate a discussion on U.S. youth advocacy, please welcome Jaleesa Hall, founder and CEO of Raising a Village Foundation. Oh, come on, we're at a youth development conference. We can do better than that. How are you doing, everyone? That's more like it. Indeed, indeed. I am just so happy to be in the room with you all this, this afternoon. My name is Jaleesa Hall. I am the founder and CEO of Raising a Village Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that is located in the District of Columbia, where we provide intervention programs and community resources in education, health and wellness, and the arts all across the district and Maryland. And so to be in this place just makes me feel so good inside because we are all on the same mission, which is really to, up, to build up our youth. Is that right? That's right, indeed. So we're gonna have some fun this afternoon. Can we have some fun together? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. As you all know, we are here to talk about how to foster youth-led organizations. And I am just so privileged to have some amazing youth and young adults in this space with me this afternoon. And so I'll be, uh, I would like to just start and doing short introductions. So you heard from the phenomenal beautiful future president of the United <laughs> States. Asha, let's give her a hand.
Asha, of course, is a student at The Ohio State University and has continued, oh, all right now, um, and has continued to work um, with the Boys and Girls Club, just giving back to an organization that has given so much to her. And so again, we thank you for being here. Um, we also have Samuel Des Desai that is also here. Let's give, us, let us give a hand for Samuel. Samuel at 18 is the chair my word, the chair of the Maryland Youth Advisory Council that's really about advocating for youth in rural Maryland. So let's give again Samuel a hand. We also have Isabel Mavri... Mavri Mavridas Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm working on my R's and rolling my R's today. Um, Cal Daron, she is also 18 and is a disabled Latina who really advocates for disability rights. And she actually was Teen Vogue's 21 Under 21 Revolutionary Youth for 2022. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And lastly, we have... <laughs> We've been working on your name since, since, since being back there. But Amaris, amen, amen, oh, there we go, <laughs> um, who is a grassroots organizing manager at Mentor, and you'll be hearing a little bit about her a little later on, but she has been critical in the role of really helping to cultivate Mentor's policy as well as their advocacy agenda. And so again, we're so happy that you're here with us today. You know, the reason why this conversation is so important to me, because about 12 years ago, I was an 18, 19-year-old student at Clark Atlanta University, which is an HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it was there, I heard a few claps in the, in, the, in the building, so there may be some HBCU grads in the building. That's all right. And when I was 18 and 19 years old, I saw a college campus surrounded by a blighted community that was reeling um, from white flight and that was on the emergence of gentrification. And so at 18 and 19 years old, a group of my closest friends started an organization called Driven Student Organization. It started with six of my friends, then turned to 100 members of the organization, and it is now Raising a Village Foundation. And so I understand the importance of feeling the burn to really help your community at a young age. And even if you are 18 and you're not 33 yet, which is what I am, I can tell you that if you continue to do what you are called to do, you will make a difference in this world. And so I'm, again, I'm just honored to be here. Are we ready to get started? Yes. So here's my first question. How is leadership fostered in youth-led movements? And I want everybody just quickly to, to answer that question. How is leadership fostered in youth-led movements? Asha? Absolutely, I'd love to start. I think that leadership is, we kind of approach it like it's mysterious, like some people are just born with the natural ability to lead. But I think that one of the amazing things about you know, us as humans is that we are able to gain skills and cultivate skills. And so starting at a young age, if you know, or if you're hoping to get into a field where you wanna advocate for something that you believe in, whether that is something as small as an issue within your school or something as large as youth mental health, nation, youth, youth mental health nationwide, mm -hmm. um, as young as you can start, if you can articulate that, I think that is where leadership begins. When you are being put under pressure and you're able to still come out and articulate what you believe in and articulate what you, what you believe in um, so that you're able to actually uh, uh, be an agent of change through mm -hmm. that and not just be a victim of what, is your, what your situation is. I love that, being an agent of change versus being a victim. I love that. Samuel, what about you? Absolutely. Youth leadership is obviously something very important because, you know, we are the next generation. Mm. Um, and so if you're involved at a young age, you know, you have the ability to and you need, have the ability to take the skills that you learn early on and you carry them through the rest of your life, you know. And so the fact of the matter is when you start at a young age, you can, you can build these skills early and carry them through the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and so obviously that's something that's very difficult. Uh, but if you, if you approach it right and you work hard, uh, it can be very easy. Indeed, indeed. What about you, Isabel? What do you think? I think that when movements are led by youth, 
we empower the people who are directly impacted by the policies that we are fighting for. Mm. Because young people are inherently the recipients of the change we're fighting for because they are the ones inheriting the world that we are fighting to change. I am part of a movement, the disability rights movement, that unfortunately isn't youth-led. Mm. If anything, I tend to be an oddity within the protests and the events that I work in. And I see so many young people who have the potential, who have these unique skill sets that come inherently through youth that are being left behind in this movement, that the movement could be just so much better if these young people were involved in. And it's something that I hope changes. Indeed, indeed. What about you? Well, I think um, Whitney Houston said it best when she said, I believe that children are the future. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the way. Um, but I want to also emphasize that young people are not just the future, they're also the present That's right. in the past. That's right. um, and so before I started advocacy work, I worked as a nanny and every time on the playground I would hear one of my kids stand up for themselves and all the parents would look towards me. I'm like, yeah, that's my kid. <laughs> <laughs> and what I realized was that um, little people turn into big people. That's right. And so instilling these advocacy skills in them, even as toddlers, um, could really just impact how they navigate life as adults. And I like to think that um, youth-led uh, movements are inherently um, fostering those um, types of relationships, and not just for youth, but for adults as well. Adults are learning from young people as they lead these movements. Indeed, indeed, thank you so much. And the word I kept hearing is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. So let's talk a little bit about that. Asha, what role does advocacy play in strengthening and sustaining youth-led movements? I mean, talk about that for me. Absolutely. I think advocacy is one of those things that we approach with a hot fork. Like, we're nervous to talk about what advocacy <laughs> means because uh, it becomes this big issue. But one of my favorite ideas is the fact that you don't take on the element all at once, you take it on chunk by chunk. Mm. And so when you're looking at how advocacy specifically affects young people, when you are teaching them that their voice matters, when you're teaching them that their beliefs and their core values actually are important, mm. uh, they're willing to step up and step forward. They're willing to actually take a more focal role in these movements. And so advocacy, I think, is one of those breeding grounds where you're allowing people to just decide what they believe. Mm. And beyond that, um, learn how to stand on what they believe, learn what hills they're willing to die on. And I think that fosters leadership in and of itself. I think it fosters self-confidence. Um, and so we are the past, the present, and the future. And so as we move forward into, while we are inheriting these roles, mm. you know, we're not always gonna be young. And so as we are moving <laughs> forward and inheriting roles, when you start now, when you start at 10, 11, 12, 13, deciding what you believe on, uh, the roles that you inherit don't feel as big. Mm. They don't feel as insurmountable, but just another step in the journey uh, of what it means to be a leader, especially today, especially in this age. That's good, that's really good. Um, Samuel, let's, let's, kinda, let's kinda settle in on you, right, in your story. Um, we know that you have been really big on garnering support for youth in, in rural Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so understanding kind of what that means in regards to state policy, can you talk about what are some of the strategies you use to really garner the support of youth in that area? And also maybe what are some of the growing edges that you've learned as you try to, try to advocate for youth in your area? So one of the biggest issues with youth advocacy um, is that the, the advocacy networks are centered around specific groups of people, whether that's wealthy people in well-to-do areas or whether it's people with a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the opportunities are centered around those people. Um, one of the big problems with the Maryland Youth Advisory Council, for example, is up until a few years ago, half of the people that were applying came from three different high schools in the state. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you're focusing on these specific voices over and over again, you're not including the voices that really matter, the people that don't have a voice in policy. And so going back to your question about how, how do I bring in these rural people, one of the key things that I have done on my council is host a community conversation where we bring in uh, people from all different walks of life in the state of Maryland. Uh, and we have just have a discourse with them, ask them about 
uh, their beliefs on specific policy issues. And it's, it's really a discussion. And you know, while I might personally not agree with half of these people in the room, <laughs> um, you know, I, it's still important to hear their perspectives and advocate for them because their voice still matters. You know? It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or, or wealthy or poor, your voice still matters. Uh, and my role uh, on the Maryland Youth Advisory Council has been focused on bringing in all voices throughout the state. That's fabulous, that's fabulous. Um, Isabel, you know, as a young disability rights activist who has just done some really amazing work um, in really a short amount of time, um, please explain from your point of view, tell the audience what is intersectional disability justice for those that might not know, right? Because, you know, we don't want to have the curse of knowledge here. So what is, the, what is intersectional disability justice and why is that important, especially in youth-led movements? Absolutely. So disability justice, to break it down, is this idea that in order for the disabled community to achieve justice, we don't need a cure, we don't need to overcome our disabilities, we need to, for society to accept us. Mm. We need accessibility and we need accommodations. <laughs> and once we have those things, we can thrive. And to go through this in an intersectional manner means that we are acknowledging that the disabled community is not a monolith. Yeah, yeah. Which is why it's so important to take into account race, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status when we're advocating for disability justice. Mm. But intersectionality within the disability justice movement also means that we're looking at other social justice movements as well in an intersectional manner. Mm. Oftentimes, historically, other social justice movements have not been accessible and have not really had disabled voices heard. And which is why, as a disabled community who has the specific skill set to know what disabled people need, it's so important for us to go and be part of those movements. Um, recently, I served as the accessibility consultant for the Australian National Climate Strike. And that has nothing to do with disability rights. Mm -hmm. But disabled people are still impacted by climate change. We're actually disproportionately impacted. That's good. So intersectionality means combining our skills, working together, having movement solidarity, because that's the only way that change is going to happen. That's right. And it, to answer your question, the meat of your question, on why this is so important for youth-led movements, like I said, historically the disabled, disability rights movement has not been youth-led, which is really unfortunate because there are so many issues in disability rights that primarily impact disabled youth. For example, education. The education system for disabled students is truly abysmal. And while disabled students might be going through the education system, interacting with laws and policies they might not even know about, mm. For me, I know that when I learned about the laws and the policies that protected me, it gave me an ability to advocate for myself in the classroom. And once I realized that those laws were not enough, <laughs> it gave me to add the agency to advocate to change those laws. And like recently, I testified to New York City City Council because to implement remote options in New York City public schools. And the problem was that I was the only disabled person testifying and the only student testifying and the only one actually directly impacted by the issues that we were debating. Wow. There was other people testifying, but they weren't direct impact, direct people who were being impacted by this policy. Mm -hmm. And even though what I had proposed did come to be and those remote options were put in place, I could only imagine how much more change would happen if the people who were actually stakeholders in the conversations were the ones leading the movement. That's right, that's right, excellent, excellent. Amaris, you're, uh, um, you're gonna talk about um, what the mentor policy and advocacy agenda is shortly. So I don't wanna you know, stump on your thunder there, but let me just ask you this. Think, tell me about the importance of why youth need to, youth or young, even young adults need to be a part of the policy conversation and just how you made your voice heard in order to be a part of that conversation. Can you do that for me? Right, sure. Um, I think that there are um, a lot of bills and programs that we're advocating for um, and youth voice is very critical in that. Um, so even now uh, we are asking folks to um, reach out to their members of Congress, um, to um, ask them to support an increase in the OJJDP um, youth mentoring grant, which is the only um, mentoring specific line item in the federal budget. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> we're asking folks to really just um, reach out to their representatives um, and to use their voice in that. Um, and I think that one thing that is 
really evident um, that youth voice is critical in that. Um, even if this is approved, then that means that programs who include youth voice are actually more likely to have their grant approved. So we can kind of see how that could impact folks in real life. Thank you, Amos. I appreciate that. All right, and so just quickly and just like one word, can you tell me how has being in this position as a leader just impact you in one word? So for me, it has given me passion. That is what it's given me. What has it given you? Let's just do a quick, quick round. I think it's given me, uh, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go with determination. Mm. What about you? Drive. Drive. Agency. Agency. Community. Community. Can we all just give a hand to these wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, I don't know about you, but I just have the faith to know that I think our world is in good hands. How about you? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, I, before we leave, we uh, just want to be able to let you know that Amaris is going to take the floor for us to lead us in talking about the launch of the Youth in Advocacy magazine, as well as to cultivate and garner us for a call of action. So Emrys, the floor is yours. Let's give, us, let's give her a hand. Let's give, let's give them a hand. Right? Hi, everyone. Um, I know I was just up here two seconds ago, but I just want to take some time to reintroduce myself. Um, my name is Amaris Ramey. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the Grassroots Organizing Manager at Mentor National. Today feels very nostalgic for me. Um, I started my position last year in the middle of Summit. Um, I was literally attending from my living room. Uh, although this podium isn't nearly as comfortable as my futon, um, I will say that I am so honored to be here with you all in person. Um, so I am the oldest of five. My younger sister is four, going on 40. And the only reason I don't think she's 40 is because I was in the delivery room when she was born. Um, I turned 25 this Monday and I saw her and I asked her what she was gonna get for me for my birthday. And she said, I don't think you have a birthday. And I asked her why she thought that, um, and she said, well, you didn't come to my birthday party um, last month. And I said, I had the flu. And she said, you could have worn a mask. And I'm like, okay, okay. So, <laughs> COVID babies. So we came to, <laughs> we came to an agreement together um, that for my birthday present, I would be allowed to tell you all a story about her on stage. So um, here it goes. She started preschool two weeks ago. Um, and you know, when I was in preschool, I was probably practicing how to spell my name or color in the lines. Um, but my baby sister was in the dining room lifting weights. <laughs> and my mom asked, why are, you, why are you lifting weights right now? And she said, I have to let everyone at school know that I'm a strong girl, that I'm so powerful. And as I was preparing the remarks to launch this online youth magazine and announce some, that Mentors um, has an upcoming youth-led advocacy guide, I thought about the theme of the project, which is power. And my baby sister's actions resonated with me a lot. Um, she looked at power as something that's tangible. For her, the weights that she was holding represented strength and resilience. After digging a little further, I found out that this strength training that she was doing was not random. Um, it had been happening over a series of months. She didn't wake up one day and learn how to lift 2.5 pound weights. She was taught by her older sisters who used weights to build her own personal power, and then she redistributed that power to her younger sister. My sister was equipped with the correct tools, the weight. In this crowd today, there are so many mentors, teachers, programs, funders, and parents. And I want you to take a minute and ask yourself, how can you equip the young people in your life to authentically lead movements? And this is not a one-size-fits-all type of answer. Um, just as my sister needed to have the proper equipment that is compatible with her weight and her height before she lifted her weights, 
we have to ensure that young people have the proper tools to engage in advocacy work. But the tools are not just enough. Um, does anyone in the crowd remember the show Bob the Builder? Okay, so it, it's a lot of you in here, so don't embarrass me when I do this. Um, Bob the Builder. Yes, we Bob the Builder. Yes, we I remember being younger, and I was like, why is he so adamant that he can fix everything? <laughs> in the theme song and throughout the show, you heard the cast assuring us that Bob could always solve the problem because he was a builder. But he wasn't just building things haphazardly. He actually learned from his mentor, his dad, who was a builder himself. And if you watched the special, you would know that. <laughs> so as you're working with young people every day and you find all of these tools and resources to give them, how do you help them transition from being someone who envisions a building to someone who can plan for and construct that building? You give them power. Okay. Last year, when I first started my position at Mentor, I sat inside um, a Zoom meeting with three Mentor affiliates. I want to give a quick shout out to Aristide Hill, Mentor's affiliate in Connecticut, Hannah Krieger, Mentor's affiliate in Colorado, and Sarah Schaefer, Mentor's affiliate in Minnesota. Um, we sat in a room with a handful of my colleagues, and I was told that with the support of, a city, um, of Citibank, we were planning on developing and executing a youth-led advocacy guide. The purpose of this guide was to provide youth, young adults, and mentoring programs tips and best practices for youth-led activities and events. A week after the meeting, I spoke with my supervisor about being the project manager of the guide. At the time, I was 24 and still falling within the age range of the young people whose voices we were looking to amplify. As a young person, I saw firsthand in my own position the way that Mentor pours into young people is evident by the fact that I was trusted to lead this project. So we wrote job descriptions, set up interviews with young people from around the country to help us develop the guide. We ultimately selected five young activists, Titiana Howard, Layden Street, Khalil Psycho, Jenna Kane and Leo Coro. They worked alongside mentor affiliate committee members and mentor national staff to develop the guide and magazine. Every week, we were in a meeting with young people between the ages of 16 and 24, and the word that kept coming up was power. From those meetings, we decided on a couple of things that we wanted the advocacy guide to discuss. Youth power, tips on how adults can support youth and their personal power, institutional power, collective power, and how they can help them exercise power. If you take a look on this screen, you will see the cover of the Youth Led Advocacy Guide. This design was created by our graphic designer, Maite Nazario, who is 22. They are also a street art activist. Although the guide will not be released um, until April, I am so excited to share with you today the launch of the online magazine, Youth Pack, which stands for Youth Power Advocacy Collective. In your chairs are postcards with the QR code. Please take a moment, scan this code to access the creative work of young people from around the country. Each column is managed by a young activist. Our sections include health and wellness, politics and advocacy, identity and community, and equity and education. We are still seeking submissions from young people under the age of 24 up until this spring. So if you know anyone or you are that someone who's interested, please follow the guidelines under the submit button on the screen. So I thank you all for being here this evening and I am so grateful that I am surrounded by such passionate people today. Um, but before I close out, I want to just go to the next slide and talk to you about how you can put your power into practice using Mentors Action Center. So have a favor, everyone get out your cell phone. Actually hold it up so I can see it, yeah. All right, great. So go on the internet browser and type in mentoring.org slash advocacy. So this call to action is for you to stand in your power by contacting your elected officials today. Um, the template letters and tweets advocate for the OJJDP Youth Mentoring Grant, which I just spoke about, the Foster Youth Mentoring Grant, the Youth Workforce Readiness Act, the Mentoring to Succeed Act, the Transition to Success Mentoring Act, the 2023 National Mentoring Month Resolution, and the Bipartisan Congressional Youth Mentoring Caucus. 
You can click the links on the page to learn more about each of these. So I think that I am almost at time, but I really want to take some time to just thank the crowd. I want to thank you for how you show up every single day. The mentoring field would not be the same without you all here. I'm going to run back to report back to my baby sister tonight and let her know that you loved her story. So hopefully I'm in her good graces. As you leave this conference today, I hope that we can all engage youth by passing them the mic and giving them the tools that they need to lead authentically. Thank you. To the mentors stepping up, being game changers in your community, we see you. We see you, Jimmy, jumping off the sidelines to be a supportive role model. We see you, Josh, creating spaces to help students overcome the digital divide. We see you, Kristen, helping young people make moves for a better future. We see how all the hours you put in bring hope to our communities. We see you, and we're here to help you create lasting change. To continue the discussion on youth-led advocacy through an international lens, please welcome Tessie Ojo, CEO, the Diana Award. I have to say I like the photo of myself. It's great to see you all this evening. I think this is evening. Back home is about 9.30, so 9.40. Um, for those of you who do not know, the Diana Award is a charity legacy to Princess Diana. I have no time to tell you everything that we do, but I want to just tell you in a minute, quickly, the key things that we do. So every day, we work with young people to transform their lives. And we do that in two key ways. We give them hope that their lived experience is not their permanent reality. We also help them find their power to make informed choices and to use that power to tackle the inequalities or the disadvantages that has affected them or their peers. Like everybody else across the world, in 2020, something fundamental changed in our world. We all witnessed the pandemic. And I don't know about in your countries where you come from, but in the UK, we realized that the pandemic disproportionately affected minority groups. We realized that that was a direct result of structural inequalities. I often describe 2020 as a perfect storm. Because aside from the pandemic that affected everybody else, something happened in your country that we witnessed across the world. We all witnessed the death of George Floyd. And perhaps because we we're all at home in lockdown, what we witnessed was right in our face that racism still affects people till today. We witnessed that it wasn't merely just about racism, it was structural inequality that disproportionately, one, affected people because of the pandemic, but also we could see that the people who were meant to keep us safe were killing us. You know, one thing that we talk about at the Diana Award is that Princess Diana often went where the pain is. And as a charity legacy to her, it made sense that we had to go where the pain was. And for us, what that meant was we began to ask young people, tell us about what this means to you. How is all of the things you're witnessing affecting you? And my goodness, if you don't want to change anything, please never ask a young person, <laughs> because they tell you. And when they tell you, you have to act. This evening, I'm delighted to have two young people who told us, and they're going to come up in a minute to share with you what they told us and what we're doing about it. Please join me in giving a huge welcome to Ashley and Melvin.
Guys, I've just given a quick introduction. Do you mind just telling everybody what your names are, where you're from? Cool. Hi, my name is Melvin Riley. I'm a political and social activist for mental health, youth representation, entrepreneurship, and education. And I've been doing that for the past eight years. As well as that, I'm a social tech entrepreneur, a speaker, and an economics and politics student. Um, I'm Ashley, I'm 24, and I'm doing my master's in public health and health promotion at the moment. And I'm really interested in going into mental health policy. Amazing. Thank you. So as you can tell, they're not busy at all. <laughs> They've got loads of time. <laughs> so Melvin, please tell us a little bit about the Changemakers Project. Um, and tell us why this, firstly, how this was a youth-led movement and what the project was about, what the program was about. Cool, so the Changemakers program was designed by young people for young people, specifically to use social action to tackle services for young people. So those four streams young people could join it on. It was, there was policy, engaging frontline practitioners, changing attitudes, and peer-to-peer. -peer. And me and Ashley both chose the policy avenue, specifically on education reform. And from that, we co-founded our campaign, Not So Micro, performing teaching qualifications to include microaggression training as a mandatory element as part of their qualifications. And, and, and tell me a little bit about youth-led, how this was a youth-led movement. So, um, because it was designed specifically by young people and co-produced with young people, it was a thing where everyone during the campaign stuff was allowed to sort of express what they wanted to do. So there was no, there was sort of adult oversight, but not to a thing where they were like, you need to do this. We had a lot of freedom. And that's how me and Ashley really saw, thought like, okay, Not So Micro is what we want to do. And when we had the idea, we had all the support that we wanted. Absolutely. And just to give context, the Changemakers program was specifically to tackle um, racial trauma and making sure that young people had access to culturally competent mental health support. Yeah. Right? Good. I'll come over to you, Ashley. You chose, as part of the, as, as part of the Change Makers program, to work on microaggression. Yeah. Tell me why. So, with microaggressions, they're a topic that have been on the rise, but it's kind of overlooked by a lot of people. Um, so, a lot of minorities experience them, but particularly with black people. In the UK, we recently had a case where um, a child was told that they had to sit alone at lunch because their hairstyle was messy, they had untidy hair, and the parent like, had done cornrows in their hair. So a child had been penalised, isolated, and made to feel like they'd done something wrong for something that was a cultural norm. And that, something like that can affect your mental well-being, and there's evidence to support that as well. And the particular issue with microaggressions is they can escalate into very overt racism. So I'm not sure if it got any coverage over here in the States, but we had a, um, a case called Child Q. Um, it was a 15-year-old girl. She was in her education setting, and she was taken out by the police with no teachers there, um, and they strip-searched her because a teacher had said that she smelled a bit of like cannabis. Um, her mother reported that she was on her period as well. She was told to spread her butt cheeks and cough as well. So they dehumanised this poor girl and it just changed the way her mental health is long term. So microaggressions are something that need to be addressed and tackled. Can you... She was 15. 15. And her mum now says that she's like, self-harmed, that she can't sleep properly like something that escalated from maybe a stereotype about black people, about cannabis, led to something, her experiencing something that has fundamentally changed her mental health in the long term. And I guess that's what, sometimes you, I suppose for you guys, it's not just about tackling a big thing, it's let's start little, let's start talking about those little things that ultimately affects your mental well-being. Exactly. So we're called not so micro because, yeah, they're called microaggressions and they're small. But when you look at like being penalised for your hairstyle and being made to sit separately, that's not something that's small. That's not a micro issue at all. Absolutely. Did you want to add anything? No. I feel like Ashley. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I want to come to you, uh, Melvin, because. There's a phenomenon out there about strong black person, strong black woman, strong black man. I suppose my generation, generations before me, had to take everything, put on this persona that 
you're strong, you can take it, and you were not allowed to complain, you just had to get on with it. And I suppose from, your, from the young, from what you guys tell us is that you don't want to have to be strong. You want, A, you want support. You want to, A, not suffer in silence. You want to also be able to seek help when you want. And, you, and, and so for your generation, I suppose, how do we change the dial so that we, we almost stop this whole strong black person phenomenon? Cool, so I feel like I need to provide some context. So like in the UK, majority of young black people are first generation and second generation migrants compared to here in the US where it's been quite generation for a very long time. So with that being said, a lot of our parents have come straight from wherever they are. So my dad came from Jamaica to the UK, my mom came from Zambia to the UK. So it's a thing where a lot of their traditional practices, their trauma-based practices in terms of how we look at mental health is then passed down and that trickles down into the cultural environments that we go to. So I feel like it's now about how do we make these key pillars in our communities more inclusive for mental health. So going to churches, going to community centers, going to community gro groups, going to these elders and discussing with them how we can sort of change how we look at mental health and provide them with the resources that's necessary in terms of taking a step forward. And I think from that, our generation and the next generation will co to come will have a better outlook in terms of how we look at mental health as a whole and be more open about it and discuss more. And so part of that is making sure that across communities, yeah. particularly minority communities, that we encourage people to talk about their mental health. Yeah, and that's, I feel like with our generation, we're very open about it and our parents are just learning to be a lot more comfortable. In my household, I feel like it's a lot easier. My mom was a mental health nurse and that sort of allowed the environment to speak about whatever issues were going on. But for a lot of people, that's not normally the case because our parents aren't educated in that mental health space. So I feel like moving forward, it's about us as young people educating our parents, but then being open-minded in the discussion. Amazing. I love that you, you are focused on the entire ecosystem. Yeah. Because I feel that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. I'm going to come to you next, Ashley. You've just completed a huge survey in the UK, a huge survey. You guys are amazing. Tell us about it. Um, so again, I'll just provide some context because we're a bit different to America in the sense that because we're a lot smaller, um, education and like the related laws and legislation are done at national level. So with our campaign, we are looking at national change. So what we did was we released a survey and we got almost 300 teachers responses. Um, and in that survey, we did find that 94% of them said that they agreed that anti-racism training should be included in their teacher training. Wait, wait, 90 what? 94. Percent, oh, come on. <laughs> and that just validated all the work we've been doing. But the major issue was that 70% of them, over 70% of them said that they'd never received any training like that before. Okay, I need to pause. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Over 70% had never received any training on anti-racism. So let me just clarify. These are people who have responsibility for our children, for a, a range of children. If our educators have no training in racial bias or whatever, how can they look after the children in their charge? They can't. And I think educators and mentors, if they're not adequately trained to deal with like racist incidents and microaggressions. They're doing a disservice to the young people that are in their care. I'm gonna tell you, I, these guys are gonna take over my job. <laughs> You're right. And it's just, I believe that um, mentors, teachers, educators, um, they need to be teaching their young people if they've ever experienced things like that, that they have to instill resilience and most importantly teach them that it's not their fault they've experienced it and they shouldn't have to put up with it either. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much to unpick. I just want to keep talking, but I'm going to quickly ask you one question and see how much time we have left after that. You are an entrepreneur, Mervyn. Yeah. There's so much that you want to do around this space. And I know that when we were having a conversation earlier, you talked about creating safe spaces for young black men, women, yeah. particularly students, to, to rest, to build their own identity, safe spaces where they can just build their identity. Yeah. 
Tell me about this project. Of course, okay, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna keep this as brief as possible. So, I'm at university, and in the UK, we don't have HBCs like here in America, and there's not much focus on the black student experience. So, when I was there, I was like, how can we elevate this experience? What can we do? So, I did some research around the black student experience. So, in the UK, um, black students make up about 8% of the student population, so that's about 220,000 black students. And with that, I did some more research and digging, and from that, the numbers are saying we're 1.5 times more likely to drop out, we're more li likely to um, suffer from increased mental health issues, racial abuse, and the list was endless. So I was like, okay, the UK will never accommodate for a black university, that's just unrealistic. So how can we use technology to revolutionize how we tackle race equality? So it's been up on the screen for ages now. But um, I launched my startup, Atlas Black. It's the first of its kind social media app for black heritage students in the UK, with the whole focus on tackling key areas that black students are facing. So there's the streams of ranking guide forum community, business, well-being, and connect. And all these different elements of the app um, are there so that young people, young, be young black students, can actually navigate through university a lot easier. And there's a, to wrap up, there's a quote by Malcolm X, and it's, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. And black student, if once this app is created, it's a thing where black students in 15 years won't have to struggle with the same issues that we see today. So yeah, Atlas Black, connecting black students, building our community. I've got 30 seconds. What do you need? Money. There's loads Money. of people here. Money. Tell them what you need. <laughs> if you want to see me after, yeah, just sign a check and just send it my way. <laughs> and that'll be great. Amazing. You guys, uh, you are called change makers for yeah. a reason because you are creating change. You know, Princess Diana believes that young people with the right support can change the world. And you're changing that. I'm so proud of you guys. Thank you for all you Thanks. do. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, <nice. laughs> Look at this animation. Thank you. <laughs>
I can think of no better way to celebrate National Mentoring Month than to be here with all of you, the people who are doing the work to drive this movement forward. Finally, as a lifelong Washingtonian, I'm excited and proud to introduce three poets from the DC-based area nonprofit Words, Beats, and Life. These talented young people will be sharing pieces they have composed about the power of mentoring. Please welcome to the stage Alana Ernst, Sasa Akil, and Serena Patel. This poem is a tribute to my teachers, and it's called Icebergs. You gave us stories to eat like they were food, and when our stomachs rumbled, you called us volcanoes, placed the sustenance of myths into our gaping mouths. This is lentil. This is cinnamon. This is apple. This is for you. I am five, and I am not ashamed of wanting to take a bite of the earth. It looks perfect and colorful and maybe a little too hot to swallow, but it's the kind of heat I can't help longing for. The kind that burns the roof of your mouth and makes you remember the cost of your delight even as you smile. Be careful. Blow on it first. Whenever I read a singular word, it feels like I am trying to climb an iceberg. I grow tired of slipping and try to lick the ice until it melts, but my tongue just grows numb and even more sloppy. I'm eight, and I've been listening to stories since before I could talk. I want to be a writer, and yet I cannot read. For the first time, I failed myself for a reason I can name. You read us a book about a girl who stays inside every day during recess while her teacher cups his hands so that she can place her feet on his palms and get to the top of an iceberg. I look at your interlocked fingers and understand that you are telling me to step on them. I fall. And I fall and I fall until my hands don't get cold anymore and I can climb to the top of the iceberg. I don't see your smile because I'm lost in the view of the ocean beyond this peak. You give me a book of poems to read and I fall in love with the words vorpal and latticework. In my green composition notebook, I write the story of a girl I know who has a hole in her chest because of the hole in somebody else's chest, the story where I am eating Oreos at nine and she's 10 and already we know too much. I don't write about the holes though. I write about the Oreos and the sky. You leave little pink post-it notes all over my metaphors and tell me that they are beautiful. For the first time in years, I do not flinch away from the volume in my own voice. I pen a hundred poems with Fennec Fox ears and wobbly full legs. I walk through a hundred hallways without seeing anything, knuckles bleeding, I breathe as little as possible. I am not worth the air. I tap out rhythms on my knees during math class and don't raise my hand. I'm 13 and I do not belong anywhere in the world other than the chorus room where we're singing about flickering candles and light and snow and heroes with paper bag capes. Every day when I open my mouth, you say beautiful. And here, only in this room, I smile. These days, I am more whisper than wonder. We are hiking in the woods and there was a gap in the mountain two feet wide, 15 feet to fall, and my friend helps me leap across, but I'm too scared to come back. You jump over the gap and help me go the long way around. There is still a gap the long way though, but before my breath is yanked from my lungs, you interlock your fingers and gesture at me to step on them. I do, and I do not fall. You tell me to stop saying thank you. I'm 14 and still so afraid of the climb. In a classroom on the same floor where I counted 60 seconds for every time I washed my hands and wished my voice would leak away from my body slowly so that nobody would notice me go completely silent, you tell me to sing louder. When I can't, you tell me to pull as much of the world into my lungs as I can. I was guilty at first and afraid because it made me so big. But the world tastes like lentils and cinnamon and apples red-cheeked in the early autumn chill. Thank you. This poem is called, I've Never Had a Mentor. I've never had a mentor. My feet knows the ghosts of many hands, the bones of many mouths, the shoulders, 
of many giants. In my dreams, I don't take leaps of faith so much as crowds surf skeletons, feel myself threaded like suitcases through sweaty hands. The efficiency of airport security eludes me. I like to think that my body is always in transit, always translated as lost across languages and spangled, and even the stars reflect dead light into our skies to return us some of their wisdom, like an old book they borrowed and forgot to give back. And I had thought for a time that there must be an economy of sharing in space that we just don't have, a sincerity that we humans just don't add to connection. Because what does mentorship promise, really? Bright kids become sad adults. The weight of the world in their hands turn to hands on their shoulders, turn to shoulders falling to their knees, turn to keep them on their toes. Old enough to touch the sky, but try touching anything primed to explode, and you will be blamed for it. It is hard to be a kid nowadays. I no longer know how to name myself without devastation, how to rely on someone else without making them name me. I believe we are all just trying to touch each other, just us justifying the need to name someone else's weight above our rapidly sinking own. My mother gave me her wedding earrings and said, one day you will fold into circles for someone else to adorn you, and I will have no one to make me shine. But I'm Atlas, Mom. I'll hold the sun on my head as long as it takes for you to feel warm again. And I think of all the silly ways we savor ourselves. And I know that I was wrong. We on this earth are so loved and so primed to love each other. Poets are desperate. When are they not? To understand the body beyond touch, beyond just carrying what you call us. But if you call us what we carry, you can call us each other. That's all we have, and that's word to my mother, our stories, our spines, ourselves, and our lovers. Because what do we owe to each other, really, but ourselves? I have a dear friend, and I would put wings on those ankles if only so she could fly closer to me. Maybe love and mentorship are footsteps in tandem, walking each other home, but like, face to face, everything we need to know in each other's eyes. I've never had a mentor, I think, because I've always approached it with the wrong economics, looking for someone to find me, hoping they'd lead me further, somewhere, out of here, when all they can do is lead me back to myself. My theory is we feel each other to feel less othered, construct entire ecosystems of care, scholars, lovers, vines, hands, and stars seeking twine with each other. Celebrated and chosen, elevated and rosen, maybe carrying each other isn't such a burning weight to be on the shoulders of giants if I get to carry them back home. Thank you. I've never been a mentor, so this poem is dedicated to my mentor and the feeling that she gives to me. It's entitled, To My Mentor or After Her Smile. Every time I write a poem, you shake your head. You throw down your pen and bang your hand on table. You look at the sky. You suck your teeth and stare at me. Sometimes I think you have galaxy eyes. I mean, pupils like spotlights, irises like deep brown oceans of possibility. I can see it when you look at me. You believe in a tomorrow I have yet to reach, and I can't help but to believe along with you. You tell me I'm amazing. You say it so often that I'm tempted to think you're lying, tempted to fall back into the self-doubt I've always known, but your brown eyes look into mine, and I know you true. You believe in the daybreak resting behind my eyes, the glory of my tomorrow, and I believe in you, so perhaps through some circular form of logic, I believe in myself. You have faith in a me I have yet to reach. A poet with strong hands and feet that make every surface a stage, and all I know is poetry 
and I know me as poet. I know the strength of my pen and the hand that bears it. I know the truth of my breath, and you taught me to love it, taught me to bear it, taught me to bear my life story unabashed in each moment, and isn't it a beautiful thing? To walk bent backed and tired, yet knowing that you will catch me if I fall. And it is already tomorrow somewhere. And all I need do is get there. Put one foot in front of the other, and you and I, we will watch the sunrise together. Thank you. <laughs>